Welcome to Indieformer, your hub for everything indie. I'm Josh, and today this is more of a special episode of the best of the month. Please excuse my voice, I'm just coming at the end of a cold. I tracked the releases of games all month and just couldn't bring myself to excluding some excellent titles. So ahead we have 10 honourable mentions and then we'll move into the top 5. This is going to be a long one, so sit back and relax as we take a look at what August 2018 gave us. A single player RPG adventure on a planet you could simultaneously fit in your pocket or explore hours venturing through. Released back in February on PS4, Dayland has now made its way to PC. With a simple story and minimal depth in its characters, this makes for a very calming experience. It's a light-hearted and free-roaming game that has you farm, talk and build on your planet. It's comparable to games like Stardew Valley, so if you enjoy the laid-back experience that provides, this will probably sit well with you. Unfortunately, the port hasn't been so successful. The game was obviously designed for controllers, and as such there's been a lack of thought for the keyboard players out there. Gameplay is also a little clunky still, considering its original release date, you'd expect some of the clunkiness to have vanished. There's still plenty of bugs and issues that need to be addressed, but the developers are working hard to get through them all. It also feels as if the story wasn't at the helm of this project, with many feeling the end could have been far better executed. But with all that, if you want a chilled experience with some fantastically cute characters, pick up Dayland for $14.99 on PC or the PS4. Five years in the making and it's finally here. Chasm has a beautifully crafted pixel palette in a metroidvania hack and slash adventure platformer reminiscent of Symphony of the Night. Chasm is doing a lot right. It captures what made Castlevania great and is filled with nostalgia for those who played Symphony of the Night. But with repetitive rooms, enemies and items that just feel the same, Chasm almost had it. Reading through some of the comments from those who backed the Kickstarter, many were frustrated that the developers cut them out of the design process because the issues the game has now could have been avoided. It does everything really well, but doesn't excel in any field. Combat is great, yet always feels a bit lacking. The maps are procedurally generated, but never feel complete. Chasm aimed to provide endless possible playthroughs, but what we got was just much of the same. It's enjoyable for the first playthrough, but thereafter may become tedious. Chasm unfortunately doesn't live up to its price, because it doesn't strongly deliver. If it's on sale, then go ahead and pick it up 100%, but until updates come through, maybe just wishlist it for now. I know I spoke mostly of negatives, so to be clear, Chasm is a good game, but it's not a defining title. It's available on Steam, PS4 and the Vita. A sequel to the original of the same name, this cop management title has you assign police men and women to crimes across Sharpwood. It sounds simple enough, but add in traits, statistics and cops that don't turn up for work, and it becomes a little harder. This is the Police 2 is notoriously hard and has an almost vertical learning curve. You really need to read every word and carefully make your choices because one wrong move and you could be done. This game is going to take a lot of effort from you to play. This is not a casual game and is not a pick up and play. You need to be concentrating and invested in making the game work to your advantage. So be aware that this will tire you out massively. 
to accompany this, there's a great story with fantastic cutscenes, a phenomenal soundtrack and top quality voice acting. You've got to be patient with this game. It's probably not something you'll beat in a day because there will definitely be failures. If you can look past some of the ridiculous reasoning from your workers and some sometimes strange crime requirements, for only $14.99, there is an incredible amount of high quality content here. And what you're getting is a rich story, deep gameplay, and an experience I'm sure you won't forget. For Penny Dewood, death had a strange flip side. Literally. Welcome to the other side! Well, if you're here, you're most likely dead! But for Penny, there was no rest in peace. It's been some time since I've experienced a trailer like that. Just from the trailer, Flipping Death looks like it has a lot of love poured into it. It's got great voice acting, and that narrator sounds like he comes straight from Whoville. The animations are flawless, and the art bar none. The main character Penny has somehow found herself in place of the Grim Reaper, and so you need to perform their duties. It sounds quite dark, but it's actually really friendly and fun. You're given missions to complete where you need to flip into the living world and use other people's bodies as tools. The puzzle solving aspect is also really good. It never holds your hand, but always has hints on how to move forward if you're stuck. This is a game for all ages. Your kids will enjoy playing this, and you'll enjoy watching them play this. The writing is terrific, the voice acting is nothing below professional, and it's just fun. Yes, the mechanics are simple, but this isn't for your hardcore gamer. I have nothing bad to say about this title. I enjoy myself while playing it, and can see myself picking this back up when I have some spare time. If you're looking for something casual and easy to get into, Flipping Death is a must. A game we covered four years ago on Kickstarter, We Happy Few finally debuts, but at a price. Very rarely do we see indie games release with a hefty price tag of $59.99, but rarely do we see quality like We Happy Few. Play through three characters in a drug-fueled, retro-futuristic city in an alternate 1960s England. If that's already messed with your head, then you're in for a real treat. It looks and feels great, but with games of this scale coming from indie devs, there are a host of bugs and design elements that need to be improved. Exploring this world is both intriguing and dangerous. To feel joy or not to feel joy is the question. You don't want to set alarms off, but you always want to find out what's going on. Ultimately, this is a story-driven game, and if you want something to immerse yourself in, then you've got a solid choice in We Happy Few. For the price of $59.99, you'd expect a game with a lot of content and maximum testing. When people go out and buy AAA titles, they know what they're getting for the price. So it's a little disheartening to see that there are things that are bringing down what is a phenomenal experience. With a mixture of fighting, running and blending in, I guarantee you won't play another game like We Happy Few this year. Stardew Valley has you manage a farm, but imagine if that was instead a graveyard. A fantastic concept from Lazy Bear Games. Graveyard Keeper can't help but remind you of Stardew Valley. As expected, it's got a good dose of dark comedy, great graphics and animations, and good use of audio. Everything on the surface is great, but looking deeper and you run into some pretty major issues. Built around the idea of managing a graveyard, funnily enough, it's the thing you hardly touch and really just forget about. Crafting consumes the majority of your time, and many players felt their time was wasted because there was no real reason 
other than gaining a notch on your progression ladder. Many also felt that a system like this was implemented to make it seem like there was more content than there actually is. From what I can tell, Graveyard Keeper is a chilled experience that is just A to B. If you like a grind, like multiple hours for every quest grind, then this may suit you. But if you want to trust reviews, then keep your distance. Here's a quote from the Eurogamer review that sums this game up perfectly. To compare Graveyard Keeper to Stardew Valley is to reveal where it comes up short. I miss the human warmth, the addictive structure to each day, and most of all, being able to do whatever I wanted to. Graveyard Keeper never holds your hand, but it never lets go of it either. Since everything you want to do is, at least for the 30 hours I've spent with it, linked to something you need to do first. As a barbarian wrapped in bear skin, you must fight to survive in this hand-drawn hack-and-slash world. You've been hijacked into a strange world forced to fight for your life and find your way home. Loot, upgrades, weapons and bosses, Barbarian has everything you'd expect. It's got solid animations, solid sound design and just plays as it should. It has basic gameplay. Enter a level and kill the captains on it. But this basic gameplay expands, giving you more choice as you move along, and come boss fights you'll need to be quite tactical in how you approach them. This game has its issues, but nothing that can't be fixed with an update. It looks simple and repetitive, and it is, but there's a lot of progression that happens as you move along. Barbarian has been well thought out, and all of these simple elements come together to create a cohesive hack and slash that you will thoroughly enjoy. Blast your way through rooms of enemies on towards a boss. Collect upgrades, unlock guns, and do it again. Hypergun is a fast-paced roguelite shooter inside a simulation. You enter the simulation in order to create the Hypergun, the ultimate weapon. It's got procedural levels, classes and abilities. It has the staples you'd expect. Unfortunately, Hypergun is much of the same. I really want to love Hypergun. It's got the graphics, it's got the music and it's got the ideas. I was even pleasantly surprised when I booted up the game and went through the facility and how it was all laid out. The tutorial was good and gave me everything I needed to know, but thereafter, this is a real grind and counts on a lot of luck. Many of the rooms felt the same, and they really just took too long to get through. I put it down after 40 or so minutes of playing because I just didn't have the time to continue playing. It demands your time and attention, and if you want to put the hard work in, then I suggest picking this up. Updates will only improve this game, but beware that it's a little stale right now. It looks fantastic, but is ultimately held back by its core gameplay. If it's ever on sale though, it might be something to look at. You, you were forged by war, but I knew a time before it. Coined as the 2D Dark Souls, Death's Gambit is a hardcore single-player action platformer that will have you purge the souls of the undying guardians of Cyrodon. If you've been waiting for a Souls-like game, then your wait is over. And for those who don't know what I'm talking about, Death's Gambit is hard. Really hard. The whole combat system is based off a stamina bar. Have a small and light weapon, and you use less stamina per swing have a large and heavy weapon, I think you get it. The mechanic means you need to carefully plan which attacks you use, because if you run out of stamina, you can't attack. The pixel art is great, and the music is memorable, but both feel incomplete and a little janky. Not to mention that it feels a little rushed to market with many bugs and some sloppy design. But looking past that, 
The boss fights are absolutely amazing, and each one is unique in its challenges. This is essentially why you play Death's Gambit, for the memorable boss battles. It can be a little grindy, and with a lack of direction can be a little confusing. But that's what makes the game difficult. It mirrors Dark Souls in so many ways and is so similar that if you're familiar with the game, then you'll fit right in. But those that are coming into this for the first time are finding issues with it, and maybe Death's Gambit could have taken what Dark Souls did great, and not so great, and turned them into everything you've always wanted. But again, if you want epic boss battles that you can replay on harder modes again and again, then this is your game. 1999, Steam, or PS4. One of the best RTS games to be released in some time, Bad North is a charming yet brutal real-time tactics roguelike. Defend your home from Viking invaders with brutality, simplicity, and depth. Your adorable Vikings pack quite the punch when the enemies land on your turf. The game is really easy to pick up and understand. You've got groups of Vikings and point them towards the direction they need to attack. The accompanying animations are fantastic, the sounds and music make the game even better, and all in a minimalist, clean design that's easy on the eyes. I can't stress enough that this is exactly as it looks, so there's not much else I need to tell you. One major aspect you should be aware of though, is if one of your commanders dies, they're gone for good. You can't just restart and try again, so this game will test your skills and punish you for messing up. If you want simplicity at its finest, then Bad North is currently on the Switch, PS4, Xbox One, and will make its way to PC later this year. Now that we've gotten through the incredible amount of honourable mentions, and a quick shout out to Donut County, something I didn't get to look at, I want to say that picking an order for this top 5 had me ripping my hair out. All of these games deserve your attention, and the difference between them is microscopic. So without further delay, here are your top 5 indie games for August 2018. How about instead of creating a love letter to a 90s game, you create a game for the consoles of the 90s? Tanglewood completed a successful Kickstarter campaign in December of 2016 and is a true 16-bit platformer available on Steam and the Sega Genesis. How much more authentic can you get than developing for the console you're replicating? It plays the same on Steam as it does the Genesis, and for those that have played the Genesis version, it's like it was made in the 90s by a big name studio. You play as Nim, a young creature separated from home after the twin suns set. You must survive the dangerous creatures of the night and make it to the morning. Doesn't that just make you warm and fuzzy? A simple story, a simple game, all in a true 16-bit package. Developed by one man with the original development kit and processes from the 90s, you traverse 28 levels through eight chapters with time of day cycles and a brilliant soundtrack. You've got collectibles to grab, achievements to unlock and secrets to find. If you want a huge hit of nostalgia and an all round great game, Tanglewood can be had for $17.99.
Remember that hit indie title released in 2013? Five years later, and the story continues. Juan comes out of retirement for this action platformer, facing a bunch of new foes and more chicken than you'll probably be able to handle. Guacamelee 2 takes what you loved about the original and does it again. Stylish, tight controls, and the same brilliant humour are back, but this time in a much larger mexiverse. It's pretty much better in every way than the original. That being said, the original is pretty darn good, and if you haven't played it, I suggest you pick it up and complete it first to truly appreciate this sequel. But back to Guacamelee 2. It's got gorgeously handcrafted levels in some of the best graphics indie games have to offer. It's balanced perfectly and is challenging but never unfair. One's chicken form has been improved upon and the new game engine spurts more life into an already great series. The villain could have done with a bit more exposition and co-op mode can be a bit hard to coordinate. But those minor details aside, Drinkbox Studios has done what many studios seem to find impossible. And that's create a product worth being called a sequel. I am pleasantly delighted and extremely happy that Guacamelee 2 delivers. It's exactly what you want. Sassy bosses, twice the enemies, and 300% more chicken for only $19.99 on Steam or the PS4. A game I've heard very little about this month, and has fallen under the radar of many. Luca Born of a Dream is a child's nightmare. The art seemingly youthful in design packs a real punch in this story. As the marked child, you're cursed to have your inner demons come to life anywhere you go. You traverse the hellish realm of your dreams in a quest for purification. Luca takes inspiration from many modern titles and uses them to its advantage. Dark Souls, Undertale, Bayonetta and more. Even with that, it still stands out as unique amongst the ocean of indie games this month. Be warned that if you want to take your time, this is not the game to do that in. There's a constant corruption meter that creeps ever so slowly to 100%, so you need to beat the game before it gets there. Luca is an immersive experience from the second you start playing. It's a challenging ride that will frustrate you and also reward you. The graphic style only adds to this experience with a messy and scratchy vibe that makes you question whether things are really there or not, selling the idea of the nightmare. Luca has ticked so many boxes and even added some of its own, and no video can do justice explaining this incredible experience. If you're looking to get into something that's got some speed, multiple endings, and has a surprising amount of depth, then go grab Luca Born of a Dream for $19.99 you will not be disappointed. With four major outlets giving this game a 10 out of 10, and another four giving it a 9, the Messenger has solidified itself as one of the best indie games released this year. Winning four E3 2018 awards, including Best Independent Game, the grand prize winner of the Ubisoft Indie Series 2018, and picking up the gameplay design and Best Music Awards at the Montreal Independent Games Festival, The Messenger is already a must-have for any indie fan. If those accolades are not enough proof of how good this game is, then maybe I can convince you in this video. A ninja on a quest to deliver a scroll paramount to his clan's survival. An 8-bit side-scrolling action platforming story unravels itself into an expansive, time-travelling 16-bit adventure. With an original soundtrack having both an 8-bit and 16-bit version, which switches flawlessly, this is an homage to both NES and SNES gaming. The graphics are perfectly in tune with the era it's representing. This game isn't just a walk in the park. 
It's challenging at points both for the fingers and the brain. And with that challenge comes a unique mechanic in the cloud step. You only get one jump, but if your sword hits something whilst you're in the air, then you're given another jump. Paired with a wingsuit and a grapple, and it can be quite tricky to wrap your head around getting everything to work in unison. But I assure you, once you figure it out, you will feel like a true ninja. The only negative that has come from this game is in the form of fetch quests which have you do some backtracking and throws your momentum off from the story. But that being said, once you've gotten past that section, the game picks up again and continues in the same spirit. It should be noted that you will die, a lot on some levels, but that's the challenge of the platformer. A good one at that. So if you're ready to take on this Ninja Gaiden inspired adventure, you can grab this for $19.99 on Steam and the Switch. Wow. Just. Wow. That's all I need to say about Dead Cells. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Alright, but seriously. Dead Cells is so close to perfect, you might as well give it a 10. This is a game that will go down in the indie history books. Flawless graphics, flawless sound, just flawless. An easy to learn, hard to master game, Dead Cells puts you in an ever-changing castle with an abundance of enemy types to figure out. A corpse lies at the end of a prison, and every so often a pile of goop falls from above and brings life to the body. That is me explaining what happens after each time you die. Then you progress through the levels trying to get further with each run, unlocking more items to use in the next. Roguelites can sometimes feel like game over when you die. But Dead Cells makes it feel like one continuous loop. And I was stuck questioning myself when I should stop playing. You're into a run that lasts 45 minutes, you've got great items, you make it to the boss and you fail. That takes a bit out of you, but you break for an hour and you're itching to get back into the prisoner's quarters. Obviously, you become very familiar with the enemies in the beginning levels. But come to the later ones that take you 20 or 30 minutes to reach, and it can be frustrating when you die instantly from lack of knowledge. But that's the game. It becomes increasingly harder as you progress, and it's not going to give you the easy way out. There's upgrades, there's unlockables which allow the use of new paths, and there's a lot of action. I'm not going to get into the specifics of what you can and can't do, but take my word for it, this is perfectly priced, has an enormous amount of content, and is just... Wow. There you have a list that should last you until at least September, where we should be able to do this all over again. I hope you liked the new graphics for Indie Former. I put a lot of hours into making sure they were just right. And to be clear, these weren't created from scratch, but a culmination of different templates to give them a unique feel. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time here on Indie Former.